Okay, we start. Two o'clock. Yeah. A hearty welcome. Now it's two o'clock. I think we can start with the session, um, demonstrate, validate, and upscale. I really like to heartily welcome you to our session. And um, my name is Harald Krimmer. I am um, coming from Germany. Um, we are doing cluster management in the federal state of North Westphalia in Germany. And um, what we do in our cluster, we foster innovation in the area of key enabling technologies. Especially, we are talking about nanotechnology. We are talking about MAMS microsystems. We are talking about the whole range of materials. And last but not least, the area of photonics. And um, today I want to talk uh, with the speakers and also with you, the audience, about um, um, commercial success in technologies and um, how we can transform science into products, into uh, products which are successful at the market and what is the way for this and how can we foster this way and how can we encourage the companies to go this way and how can we, um, the so-called um, valley of death, gap it and um, I think one really crucial thing for this is um, so-called um, technology infrastructures and um, today um, we will have some example of technology infrastructures. Um, I'm very happy to have you all here and we can get an insight of what's going on and what you are doing. And um, yeah, with a look at the time schedule, which is really quite, uh, yeah, um, uh, fit, um, I, I really like to start um, with um, um, a presentation of the speakers. Um, first of all, I really like to welcome uh, Mrs. Uh, Pia Sandvik. Um, um, Pia Sandvik has been the CEO of the Research Institute's RTO um, um, of Sweden since 2016. Um, she has a doctorate degree in quality technology from Linköping University and is an associate professor at the um, Lulea University of Technology. Um, she has been in executive and leading positions in academia, industry and the public sector for nearly 20 years, including president of the Lulea University of Technology and CEO of a financial company in banking and insurance. Um, she has so much things that I can talk about, but to keep it a little bit short, I think really happy to have you here and Thank to you. hear something about you. Thank you. And I will go on with the next speaker. Um, uh, the next speaker is uh, Wit Wondrak. Um, he has been working at uh, VSB uh, Technical University of Ostrava since 1992, where he spent the longest period as a department of applied uh, mathematics at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And uh, he also obtained there the title of Associate Professor in 2017. 2007, sorry, 2007, not 17. He was part of the team that prepared the Project Center of Excellence IT for Innovations. We will hear something later about it, I think. Um, uh, funded by the Operational Program Science and Research and Innovation. Um, Thanks to this project, a large national e-infrastructure IT for Innovations National Supercomputing Center was built. Um, and um, he is active in very much things and had also made um, very much um, European Union projects. So also happy to have you here. The next speaker I would like to introduce um, is uh, Eugenia Vazami Jones. Uh, Eugenia Vazami Jones is a professor of environmental nanoscience at the University of Birmingham, where she's also the director of the facility for environmental nanoscience analysis and characterization, and also director of the MRES program on environmental and biological nanoscience. He has coordinated um, various um, FP7 projects like Nano Retox, uh, Mod Nanotox, and NanoMile, and she's currently coordinating the Horizon 2020 project ACE Nano. She's also leading the European Commission's nano safety cluster and uh, research is focused around the mechanisms involved in nanoscale processes in a biological and environmental context. Happy to have you here. <laughs> Last but not least, <laughs> Um, I would like to introduce uh, Irida Loinas. Um, she is director of the CETATEC Nanomedicine. Um, she's coming from Spain. Um, she was specialized in organic chemistry and her PhD thesis was focused on peptidic synthesis and synthesis in perfluorocarbon per media. So, a difficult word. In 2000, 2004, she moved to Fundacion CETATEC. In 2005, she became head of the biomaterials unit in CETATEC and the main research activities of the unit have been focused from the beginning in the synthesis and characterization of biomaterials and bio 
active surfaces. The group has also patented a new family of hydrogels based on supermolecular crosslinking, and um, she's also inventor of seven patents and has published more than 30 scientific papers, and she has coordinated uh, three European Union funded projects. So, um, also happy to have you here. So, after the um, introduction round, I would um, give the mic to um, 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 uh, Pia Sandvik, and she will tell us something about Testbed Europe, um, a forward-looking strategy for technology infrastructures. Thank you. I think I'll stand up. First of all, I would like to thank the European Commission and ETRTD for having invited me to talk about this topic, which is very close to my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, last week, on a field outside the city of Uppsala in Sweden, rapeseed, wheat, oats, and, and barley were harvested. This happened on many fields in Sweden last week. But what happened on this field was something unique. It was the first time in Sweden crops were harvested from fields connected with sensors and monitored by advanced systems for data analysis. What I'm talking about is RICE's new, RICE's new test bed for digitalized agriculture. There, connected fields, self-driving electric farming machinery, and advanced systems for data analysis shall contribute to a fossil free, more sustainable, and more profitable agriculture. This test bed, or technology infrastructure, is developed in close cooperation with our partners among them companies like Ericsson and Volvo. Agriculture is the third largest source of greenhouse gas emission in Sweden. Greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced by controlling inputs, inputs and by electrifying and automating agricultural machines. In the future, the machines can also be operated with farm-produced energy, with better decision support through sensors, and systems for data-based analysis, the sustainability and profitability of agriculture can increase. The purpose of the testbed is to create an arena for collaboration on new technology for agriculture. It provides an opportunity for both increased competitiveness, allowing industrial companies to explore a new market, uh, the agriculture industry, and support the development of new products and services that can become tomorrow's export successes. These are two main object objectives for technology infrastructure. To create areas for collaboration where societal challenges can be addressed and competitiveness can be strengthened. None of the Swedish OEMs could have built this infrastructure themselves. But through collaboration with RICE, an open environment has been created where also SMEs and subcontractors sub are welcome to test and verify, verify their technology. I believe it's fair to say technology infrastructures are the backbone of European industrial competitiveness. They are important tools to diffuse knowledge and propel a long-term sustainable European growth, productivity and innovation. They can include testing facilities, laboratory setups, development environments, under real-life conditions and innovation hubs. Technology infrastructures also include research activities, but they are open environments which ties together all parts of the innovation system, industry, academia, business development support, investors, SMEs, and public organizations. They also give SMEs access to large companies and broader value chains, and are instrumental to regional specialization. In addition, for any company about to develop or introduce a new market or service to the market, a new product or service to the market, Having address to technology infrastructure is a way to reduce risk and cut time to market. It's important to distinguish between research infrastructure and technology infrastructure. Research infrastructure is used for basic research and technology infrastructure is used for applied research and industrial development. 
For research infrastructures, there's already a roadmap within the EU, the S3 roadmap. Technology infrastructure, however, however, will not fit into the S3 roadmap. This means there's no overall picture of how many and what types of technology infrastructures there are in Europe, nor any tools to stimulate cross-border usage to make sure Europe utilizes the full potential of these resources. Today, there's some growing interest for technology infrastructure among member states. One example is the Swedish strategy Testbed Sweden, which aims to increase Swedish competitiveness, investments in R&D, attractiveness for foreign investments, and the use of technology infrastructure. By clearly identifying the competitive advantage, these facilities represent a mobilization from industry and society, and it has happened. Many regions are now working to make their technology infrastructures more visible to attract investments. The Nordic Council of Ministers for Sustainable Growth has adopted a 2018-21 to cooperation program for business and innovation policy that emphasizes that Nordic countries can learn from each other by, for example, sharing their knowledge and experience and working together through test beds. The program encourages cooperation to create conditions for a new Nordic test bed infrastructure. RTOs from all the Nordic countries are involved in this work. And in the joint declaration of intent signed earlier this year by Sweden and Germany, technology infrastructure is one of the areas where the countries will collaborate for innovation and sustainability. Existing technology infrastructures represent a large investment and are often underused. Building a collaboration within the Europe European Union and bilaterally between different countries cities and regions would allow more companies to get access to technology infrastructure. For this, a joint European strategy is needed. The strategy is needed to have better channel resources and competences, avoid unnecessary overlaps, increase the knowledge transfer between technology infrastructures transnationally, improve the rolling out of knowledge technologies and research results to SMEs. And give access to regions which do not have any technology infrastructures. It's very gratifying that the European Commission has initiated work on a strategy for technology infrastructure and drafted a staff working document. I strongly encourage continued work on a strategy and I have some recommendations for that work as well. Build a comprehensive mapping of existing technology infrastructure and include ongoing EU initiatives. Develop structure, prioritizing process and investments for cross-border collaboration, which builds on S3 experiences. Ensure a coherent European support for access to infrastructure, in particular for SMEs. Encourage public sector, but also industry, to open up as technology infrastructure and develop framework to increase trust, for example, in IP and data handling. Support the development of new business models to finance technology infrastructure, including business development and cross-border marketing activities. Appoint national hubs with a mission to provide access to each member state's technology infrastructure. Include Horizon Europe funding in parity with funding for research infrastructure. I truly wish that after these important days discussing the future of Europe research and innovation, we will have a comprehensive and forward-looking strategy for European technology infrastructures. It's needed. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, for your talk. Um, thank you very much for the um, very interesting example in the area of agriculture, but also for your thoughts about more in a general thing, what is a research infrastructure, what is a technological infrastructure, and why do we need this all? And uh, thank you very much. So, we directly hand over the mic um, to Pete Wondrak, and uh, he will talk to us about uh, IT for innovations, building supercomputing infrastructure for science, industry, and society. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, much to organizers and, <coughs> and the European Commission just inviting me and uh, uh, give me opportunity to introduce uh, our center and what we are doing in the, uh, in the direction of a supercomputing uh, for science, industry, and uh, society in general. Uh, let me start my uh, quite short presentation with a uh, uh, relatively short history of our center. So uh, our center was established in 2011 uh, and it was the, uh, funded from the European Structural Funds. Uh, and, uh, on the way, and actually the main objective and goal was just to build the first supercomputing facil facility within the Czech Republic and uh, at the same time also the competent center in the high performance computing and the high performance data analy analysis and so on. So, on the way to, uh, to achieve such a, such a goal, uh, we started f in June 2013 with our first supercomputer, which uh, was serving to uh, check uh, uh, scientific, mainly scientific community. Then in 2014, we just built uh, our new building uh, to accommodate our researchers uh, uh, and also the, uh, the building, the data room, which uh, accommodated uh, one year lately, our uh, later our biggest supercomputer, uh, Solomon, uh, which was that time uh, number 40 uh, in the world, and uh, finally, actually, our latest uh, computer came in March 2019. Uh, actually, all of those computers were uh, were actually uh, installed with support from uh, European Structural Funds, and actually, this will continue with replacement. It will be it's announced next year and uh, after uh, after next year, and so on. I will talk a little bit more a little bit later. But what's very important for us, uh, you can see, for example, uh, on, on this on, the, on this graph, how our uh, user community is growing. So and actually, it's uh, really nice because in 2019, we have even the 100 more actual requirements for the computing time that actually we are able to, uh, to provide. Uh, and actually, it means that the, it's not growing linear, but even the exponentially. So that's actually, it seems that it, this is actually true, that actually high-performance computing, high-performance data analysis, and so on, artificial intelligence, it's really, really very important uh, uh, important for the you know, innovations and so on. So that's, uh, that's very positive. And that's also the reason uh, why we are uh, going to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to actually to extend our infrastructure and provide more services to our users. So, what's happening? Yeah. Uh, but of course, it's not about only about the re, uh, about, about the infrastructure. It's also about the experience, about the knowledge, and that's actually it's possible only having a really strong research uh, activities uh, around our center. And uh, of course, our research activities goes directly to research and development in general. So, because we are supporting supporting scientists with our uh, with our infrastructure, but also we are supporting society. We are helping them to solve uh, really the societal challenges, flood uh, predictions, climatology, and, and, and whatever. So that's uh, something what uh, really supercomputers can help. And of course, to industry. Yeah. But we are not right now looking at the problem and, uh, as, a, as a one, for example, numerical solution. That's a pass, actually, that actually everyone uh, uh, knows that actually, okay, we can run a really huge uh, problem on the supercomputing, but it's not true right now. Actually, right now it's uh, about the interaction uh, between, for example, processing of the large, uh, uh, large data, for example. It's about uh, employing the artificial intelligence, because not always we, we have a exact numerical, uh, numerical uh, uh, models. Uh, actually, numerical models are, uh, let's say, producing a large amount of data. So, and those data has to be processed, interpreted, and visualized, and so on, and so on. And actually, that's actually the holistic view. And this is something what is uh, really 
uh, our task to, to, to decide what actually is the right combination of those, uh, of those uh, three domains to help, uh, uh, to help our uh, industry, society and, uh, and uh, scientists. So the one really nice example I would like to show you here is the complex industrial or uh, scientific wor workflows, which needs really all those three domains. And this is, for example, digital twin technology. But not only, for example, in the case of uh, one, let's say, industrial product or engineering product, how it's, for example, the, 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 the electric motor, but in, in general, that's the smart cities, for example, that's in fact the medical simulations. That's, uh, we can see, see this, uh, this simulation as, the, as a digital twin. This is also, for example, uh, traffic simulations and so on and so on. That's, uh, uh, that's an idea and actually that's the reason why we need really uh, a huge computing power because, for example, looking at the example of the electric motor digital twin, actually this is uh, all the problems we have to solve there. And if you look only at the, pro at the one simulation, which is the cooling system and how to optimize this motor to be better cooled, it needs, for example, on our supercomputer, 35 hours, and we would like, and we would like to be real to, uh, real to uh, near to real time. Uh, that this is a really challenging problem. So, imagine that this is something what uh, really needs a huge computing power. And this is the way uh, how to do that: just building a new computing uh, computing uh, capacities and so on. Let me just move a little bit forward. So, and uh, another very important part of our center is the digital, digital innovation hub because we don't see our role only as an infrastructure provider. Actually, we need something what we call HPC adoption program because we need to help industry, society, and also our researchers how to how to use the supercomputers. This is very important part of the of, of the digital innovation hub. This is also the collaborative research because actually it's it's continuous uh, transfer of the new technology, and actually this is uh, possible to do only using some collaborative research with our partners. And very very important part is not only the training of our users, but this is the education of the new, well experienced people because this is something what we what we really need. We need. On the, on, the, on the side of our partner, also the well-experienced people. And that's actually a really big problem because we don't have very often them. So, and this is the examples what we are doing with uh, not only our local industries like a work had just crash test for, uh, uh, for the train chairs. This is the collaboration with the Sajik car navigation company. Uh, we are also designing, for example, the uh, the helmets for the, for the kids with the deformation of the, of the skulls and so on. Of course, with the industry optimizing, optimizing the uh, water turbines, etc., etc. This is just only the products of all those services we are going to build. So, and this is the, this is the end, in fact, of my, uh, of my talk. But uh, my final slide is about the, about the near future because it's a really challenge for us because we are one of the. Uh, Euro HPC uh, uh, supercomputing facilities. We were selected as a one of the of, uh, as, a, as a one center which will host this petascale supercomputer, and we are also the member of the Lumi consortium. And all those actually uh, activities I already mentioned in my presentation will be projected also in the Euro HPC activities. Uh, uh, for, for the global Europe, so not only on the regional level. So that's, that's, uh, that's the main idea. So thank you very much. And that's the uh, end of my talk. Also, thank you very much for the um, good presentation. Uh, you were also perfect in time. Um, so, um, so I think we go on with the next presentation. The next presentation uh, comes from uh, Eugenia Vazami jones and uh, she will talk about, it's a session name, demonstrate, validate, and upscale, but uh, she made um, something in addition, um, and she's talking about safeguard. So you're talking maybe about nanotechnology and safety, I think, safety cluster. That could be. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, we have to change the presentation.
Oh, okay. perfect. That looks good. Thank, you. Thank you. So let me start by thanking the organizers for this fantastic opportunity uh, for many of us to come out of our lab and our usual environment and actually meet with uh, those who um, need to know what we do and why we do what, what we do. So um, I'm very glad you are all able to, to be here today and I'm very grateful to um, particularly to Jana and Janaris who uh, invited me to, to give this presentation today. So today I wear the heart of the scientist but also the heart of the representative of the nano safety cluster, a cluster that was um, initiated also by the European Commission some 10 years ago. Um, very much with the foresight and the idea of not leaving science to go astray, but keeping science together. And uh, we now begin to, to, to see the fruits and the purpose of, of all this um, underpinning of science and bringing science and scientists together, talking to each other, uh, working together, um, and the benefits of all of us bringing our um, ideas and our um, data together in 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 um, a joint um, op in joint opportunities, and the opportunities also bring, of course, uncertainties. And as and as our chair um, very well noticed, my presentation is not about only about what we can do to use science to demonstrate, to validate, and to upscale our. Um, our work, but also to, to safeguard ourselves, our um, colleagues in the lab, and also, of course, the, the general public. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the nano safety cluster right at the end of my presentation, but let me focus first on to why, why are we talking about big facilities? What's the purpose? What's the, the need? Um, why do we need, indeed, infrastructures and clusters and uh, bringing scientists together, other than the fact that we all seem to enjoy doing our science with, with our colleagues rather than isolated in our labs on, on our own? So collaborations are very important to, 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 to the pro progress of, of science. Um, this little map on, on um, in in my slide, in my, pre in, in my presentation, uh, is just one of um, many bro projects I've been involved in. This is a project I currently coordinate, and it just shows you how many other uh, participants are involved in this project. These are truly multi-partner, multinational projects where we bring not only our best colleagues from around Europe, but also our best colleagues from around the world, from Mexico, from China, from uh, Korea. So this is one of the important reasons why we need these large projects, because this is the only way to bring all these people together, to, to work together to, to a common goal, which is always advancing the, the frontiers of, of, of science and innovation, of course. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning here is that um, what we do is not cheap. It comes in various um, expensive packages. This is an example of one of the perhaps most expensive packages. It's a synchrotron, but there are many other examples of, of more medium scale or small scale um, large projects, which are also still uh, requiring um, the support of um, the European Commission. But this comes, of course, through the support of the general public. Um, and and, uh, and all those who can actually see what it is that we do and, and why. Okay, and this is an example of what we do when we are in the lab and um, perhaps something to give you a flavor of the complexity of what we try to achieve. So in the old days, maybe if you had a material um, that you wanted to characterize, you would take it to a bench top machine, um, analyze it, um, come with a number or with a picture and, and finish, and that's all you wanted to know. Of course, hi science has advanced an awful lot since those days, so now if we want to characterize the material, which um, a good chance is that it might be a nanomaterial, so a material of, of very, very small size, the chances of that material might also be in somewhere which is very complex to identify, find, and, and see what what it does, and indeed, the whole um, this um, circle of, of characterization needs for just the one um, material, maybe just the one product, or just the one uh, medicine, or just the one um, cosmetic, would need all this complex 
range of characterizations for us to be able to say, yes, we understand what this material does. And you need this whole range of characterization to describe its functionality, but then you need the same level of, of, of complexity in, in your characterization um, delivery to also understand whether this material is safe. So by, by far, far from um, safety being just a small component of the characterization, it's, it's in itself a very important consideration that also requires the same level of, of, of expertise and the same level of, of instrumentation to, to answer those questions about um, complex materials. Not only what they are, but what they do, where they go, um, how, what's the life cycle even, because we often find that the material that we know how it behaves today, we find that tomorrow will behave a little bit differently and maybe in a month's time even more differently so. And this time scale is not so easy to define and not the same for every single material. And of course, nanotechnology has delivered to us um, thousands and thousands of clever materials, some, many of which will become products that each one of us um, currently carries on our bodies or in our bags, and we therefore need to, to feel confident about their safety. I will also say that we need infrastructures and clusters for one more reason, and that is because we don't anymore produce little data sets that we can store in our computers. We produce enormous data sets that we um, need infrastructures to, to, to support us, to, to use, them, uh, use them effectively, and, um, and also to ensure that once these data sets are created and when the project finishes, those, the data we produce don't disappear, but are used um, beyond the lifetime excuse me, of, 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 the, of the actual project. So we do need a lot of data-driven innovation, and we do need to be sure that um, scientists speak to each other and, 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 and um, ensure the longevity of their data sets. And when they finish with them, they make them, of course, open access. And I was really delighted to, to see open access discussion sessions earlier because um, these data are there for, well, these data have been created with um, taxpayers' money and they should be there for, for posterity and so should be there for, for others to, to use them. And um, I should also add that a lot of the projects we recently oh, have been involved in are very much focused on bringing data together and seeing the big picture. For, for complex characterization, as I hope I convinced you with my previous slide involved in, in nanomaterial <coughs> innovation and safety, we actually need complex um, modeling and complex understanding of very large data sets that we are able to bring them together, but not randomly, not bringing in one bag apples and oranges, but in ways that we feel confident that these data sets are grouped correctly and are giving us a good feeling of, of, um, of the big picture of what we're trying to understand and interpret. And I didn't mention safety, so you, you, I'm sure you knew it was coming. So uh, again, nano safety and general, general safety about materials and about um, structures and, and other problems we, we solve as, as European scientists is, is again, not a trivial um, subject. And I think I've already convinced you we need as much to understand about safety as we need to understand about the property per se of a product we are uh, producing and delivering. I will say a little bit um, about safe by design, which some of you may have heard before. So. Um, the concept really of safe by design is that you no longer produce products, um, test them, discover what they do, discover their, an application for them, bring them close to the market, and then think about, hey, is this safe? Should I be selling it to people? Or maybe if it's toxic, maybe I shouldn't. So really, to, to, to maximize the opportunities of industry, especially SMEs who are on a tight budget and they might not want to develop a product all the way to, to its end, uh, to, to just before production, only to discover at that stage that perhaps they haven't thought about its, um, its safety. So safe by design is really preempting this um, 
last minute, or what has been until recently a last minute uh, question about the safety of the product. And it's bringing earlier and earlier and earlier in the production um, line the, um, the, the question and the need to, um, to test the safety of a product. So I would really like to see this arrow of um, considering safety as early in the production line as possible. Ideally, I would say, at the time of the conception of a product rather than at the, at the other end, at the time of the delivery. And I would really also like um, to advocate that we should not be thinking only about the safety of a product during its lifetime, but also beyond that and what happens to it once it's finished its, its um, usable life and becomes a burden and a problem. So that brings me to, to my final slide, which is very much about the nano safety cluster. This, uh, I already introduced it to you. It's a body that's been initiated by the European Commission, but it's very mu much a grassroots um, operation that's been run by myself and colleagues. So it's very much a, um, a scientist's um, baby, if you, if you like, but also very much um, an opportunity to get ourselves and our colleagues to, to do some things together that really transform the field. In fact, nanosafety, maybe 10 years ago, was um, almost a dirty word. People didn't want to know about it. And we, um, those of us who actually um, were doing nanosafety, felt so extremely uncertain about what we were discovering in our lab that we were very much happier, uh, some of us anyway, um, keeping our data to ourselves. So the nanosafety cluster went a very long way to, to ensure sure um, that people, whether they liked it or not almost, would speak to each other and share data and, and share ideas and, and um, come together in the same conferences and actually say, here's what I found, what about you? Do you agree with what I discovered in my lab? And nanosafety now has become a very well established, very well published, very well trusted and, and um, and a very successful field, I would, I would like to, to, to say. And we're still here as the nano safety cluster to ensure that this um, direction we are providing, this strategic direction to the field remains. So we still ensure that everyone, every new project joins the family, if you like, and, um, and they gain from being part of the nano safety family and the nano safety family gains from, from, from having them. Uh, so we make sure that synergies are there for projects to work together. We make sure, very, very importantly, I think I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that the data we generate are shared, are open and are there for the next generation um, of scientists or the next project that will start after one project finishes to take this data and take it in a form that they can actually use it, not just numbers, but actually data that um, have a continuity and they start from, the, and people are confident, scientists are confident, they know where the data came from and where it's, where it's going. Um, so, <laughs> so finally, <laughs> I'll <laughs> say the last word, which is OECD. OECD science is what ensures in the society, in the wider society, the safety of our, of our materials by providing, um, uh, by providing documentation that we can, we can trust and believe in when it comes to safety. But it's, n it's not paid for, so it comes, its support comes from our projects. And I would like to hope that we can see it continuing uh, for a little bit longer. Thank okay. you. So, thank you very much. Um, so, we go directly to the next presentation. Um, it comes from... Uh, okay. <laughs> Iraida Luinas, um, and she will talk about translational research on nanomedicine in CDTEC. And now it's your presentation. Yeah, it's the right one. <laughs> I, I would like to present you three different programs and three different uh, initiatives that uh, cover. We wanted to cover this scale up demonstration and validation of nanotechnologies in the field of nanomedicine, in the field of pharmaceutical sector, the medtech sector, and, and in cosmetic sector. And you mentioned initially when we were starting the, the session about what uh, we are doing to try to impose this innovation. So I think that I want also to show you a kind of evolution in different aspects that we have to try to include on those 
on those programs when we have been evolving to that, not only to cover the scaling up, but also covering other aspects to really push this innovation. Just a few words about CDETEC. Here we are. Uh, it is a research uh, institute based on San Sebastian in the north of Spain. So we are covering three different areas, very different areas in surface and engineering, energy storage and nanomedicine, which I'm covering here. We do applied research, so we try to push technology, develop new technology, and try to transfer that technology into products that we can bring to the, to the companies and transfer to the companies. And we thought about how we could push it that uh, in more uh, more advanced way. And we did a big investment on 18.5 million euros between 2016 and 2018 to increase, include other infrastructures in Citatech also to push that innovation. 2.65 uh, million came from pilots proposals from, from Europe. We have created in the last year six uh, new companies really to to try to bring those to the market, those uh, developments. And we are quite active in the pilots projects and the test beds. So we are participating in six of those programs and four of them have been led by, by CDETEC. I show you the first example, it's the NanoPilot project that it was funded at the beginning of the Horizon 2020. It was really focused on manufacturing and not uh, covering only the part of manufacturing of uh, in the in the field of uh, nanopharmaceutical and the pharma sector. So the idea here was to establish a pilot plant that would be able to manufacture a small size batches of nanopharmaceuticals to be used in clinical trials. So in clinical trials, when uh, you are testing the new drug into patients, the, the manufacturing has to be done uh, with the same quality system that it has to be implemented when you go to the market. And that is not easy to implement, so we, we proposed uh, here a pilot plan that could be flexible enough to include different nanosystems, uh, working of course on their good manufacturing practice, and uh, we were focusing quite a lot on translation, on, on the scaling up, trying to understand the, the process, doing the data scaling up, but also developing the quality system, the quality control that it's needed, completely needed to, to go, go further. The, the size of the batches that we were producing there, they are not big size uh, uh, of uh, nanomedicines, because the, what it's required for this initial clinical trial is really a small amount of, of drugs uh, for, to treat between 50 and 100 patients, but not doing a big scaling up. So uh, we focus on aseptic manufacturing, so to try to have injectable devices, and we use uh, the pilot plan to produce three case studies uh, for lyophilized products, monodosis, and, and liquid vials. And as I mentioned before, we just covering here the, the, the thing of manufacturing, the part of the manufacturing. So we realized that in during the project, to the transfer of these uh, drugs from lab scale to the pilot scale, most 90% of the time, what we were doing just out from the pilot plan, doing this development, validating the, the analytical methods, and the part of manufacturing, it takes only 10% of the time. So now we are trying to evolve in this in this idea to bring new, new products into the plant and really uh, think of different ways of uh, exploding and, and, the, and trying to, to improve the sustainability of this plant. So the second... Uh, project yeah up ah, here so that we we went to do this uh, this project which is the peptic apps project it was also for uh, funded in a pilot uh, uh, grant system but here we wanted to cover not only the manufacturing so we we bring to the project a new technology so with a two family of, of encapsulated products for cosmetic ingredients we work on the on the scaling up and validating the technology but we try to cover other aspects like uh, stability to toxicity and finally what we got at the end of the project it was the and new encapsulation, encapsulation systems, they were already validated and scaled up at pilot scale. So we could move a little bit further at the end of the project and created a company, which is the Misery Cosmetics for uh, exploding this technology. So now the, the plant, what is, or the pilot plant, what is doing, we are using that technology. Uh, we have two different families of, of um, uh, encapsulation systems and we can do uh, this customer uh, customized encapsulation system for different actives and we have six products already that will go to the market uh, in, in this year and uh, the next 
evolution is TVMET. It's uh, the last project is an uh, open innovation testbed for the development of medical devices. In this case, we were we wanted to cover the whole value chain, not just the part of manufacturing. So we tried to implement different aspects in the in the project and combining all of them to really evolve and to 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 develop new products. So we include. Um, what we call the SME office to, to provide uh, business advice, but also IP management and uh, to cover all those aspects that they are really important when we are, we are starting the, in developing a new product. Uh, services on regulation, on health technology assessment as well, to really cover the aspects of uh, cost benefit of the of the new products, the new medical devices that we are developing to try to reduce their reimbursement uh, processes at the end of the project and more technical aspect that it will be related to the synthesis, prototyping of myomaterials, characterization, testing, um, uh, efficacy testing, in vitro testing, safety assessment on clinical trials. So really the idea is to bring this goes a little bit uh, slow. Yeah. So the idea is that we are covering starting from a, a medical device a uh, high-risk medical device that will uh, require clinical testing and clinical evaluation. We start with uh, the beginning uh, with a prototype that has been uh, proved at lab scale. So we start covering the, the development and the preclinical and manufacturing validation, and then we can go uh, in the next step to the initial pilot uh, clinical testing with just few patients, and finally complete in the in the proposal the in the project uh, the full clinical test with hundreds of, of patients. So the idea here is that we are covering all that, that uh, process. And what we are included, which is, uh, we propose that it's innovative here, it's to do all that work based on quality by design. So quality by design, it's a, a, quality, well, uh, a new methodology, well, a methodology that has been already well established in the pharmaceutical sector, trying to understand better how is the performance of the drug. In this case, we apply that for the performance of the medical device, so trying to understand and what is the basic, the science of the, of, the, of the device, which are the critical attributes that they are going to make the device safety and, and performing in the way that uh, it's done. And based on that knowledge, just go into the manufacturing processes, try to understand which steps in the process of manufacturing are going to impact more in those attributes and those critical attributes, and also the, to uh, design the quality control system to control those aspects. So um, we can do that because we are putting together in the test bed all the labs working in a network. So we start from the very beginning doing that analysis based on risk analysis, which is uh, something that is required by the, the new regulation. And we start uh, at preclinical level working in the uh, with the characterization, safety assessment, and also efficacy and, and prototyping. So we have the loop in the, to try to understand better which are the attributes that they are critical, trying to improve that part. And when that is ready, we can move uh, in the same consortium to clinical testing and uh, the complete the, the system. So um, I told you that this uh, methodology is already used in, in the pharmaceutical sector. Usually with a new drug, there are ab about 15, 10, 15 critical attributes. When we have moved to medical devices, we are handling 40, 45 uh, attributes. So it's a little bit more complex, but uh, we, are, we are envisaged to, to complete that. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So, um, I would like to draw a question to the audience. Um, is there any company here who has already used uh, a service of a technology infrastructure? I don't see Yet. somebody. So, but um, we can discuss it also with you. So, if um, I think um, you all have found on the seats um, this document. It's about the technology infrastructure, the Commission staff working document. You also mentioned it, um, and you also mentioned some of the key findings and main goals. And uh, this is something I would like to discuss with you um, as speakers and also with you as the audience. Um, you may have seen um, 
some key findings and, and, um, and uh, main challenges are, on the one hand side, the um, topic of visibility of the technology infrastructures. The second one is uh, prioritization. That means um, to focus on special topics or tech, uh, special technologies or special branches. Uh, the third one is um, um, accessibility. Um, that means how are the conditions to get into the infrastructure and to work within the infrastructure. And the fourth one is um, it's called networks. That means um, it's the whole network of all technology infrastructures. Um, um, are there any meanings in the audience to this or questions about this? It's not the case. Could I make a comment yeah. on that? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, I think that what we see from, from uh, a Swedish perspective anyway, and I think I can talk for all the RTOs in Europe as well, is an increasing demand from industry to have uh, access to these type of infrastructures because it's a way to share risk, as mm -hmm. I said, and it's a way to also to, uh, to get... Uh, to get huger investments in infrastructure than you can do yourself, to have mm. them open, actually. And I think that is one very important aspect regarding these infrastructures, technology infrastructures, that I really think they have to be built on the industrial demand mm -hmm. because they are, they are supposed to really increase in competitiveness. And I think that's really a key issue and a key difference uh, regarding research infrastructure that is mainly focused on the researchers' needs. Yes, yes. Uh, and that is also one important aspect that I think that the business model surrounding these infrastructures has to be built on a demand where in industry is prepared to pay for to be in the lab, because that's the only way you can really get a long term, a long term business model that that will that will be able to keep up the infrastructure because I think we can see a lot of infrastructures that are based on public funding only and where you really don't have the demand, I mean, they will be dead within a few years. Mm. So it, it's really important to get on this demand. You're talking about demand of the industry. Do you see a, 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 a can, you, can you divide it as a demand of, of the big industry, the big companies, or also small and medium enterprise, or also maybe there's one hot topic, uh, it's called startups. Um, do you also see there a demand yeah. for these infrastructures? Yeah, I can, see, I can see a difference in demand depending on if your research intensive or not. Okay. If you're uh, normally research in, in, in intensive or R&D intensive, you, you normally uh, um, have better resources and, and better knowledge to, to, to describe your demand or your need. Mm -hmm. but, and, and also you are better prepared to really take, to take the risk, the economic risk, the financial risk to actually get into these infrastructures. But said that, it's really important for the SMEs to be part of that as well. And I think that we can see a gap regarding financial structures because if you see a new areas com coming up, like the Nano area, for example, where you really don't have these, these companies or industry that, are, that have the financial muscles to pay, mm -hmm. I think we really have to take some risk on uh, public funding as well to see that if we start to invest in these infrastructures, we will probably have an industry, a growing industry that will grow in Europe instead of somewhere else. Mm. Mm. Okay. That's, mm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and, and we are thinking in a way of doing that sustainable. And I think that one of the key questions could be not only providing services, but also providing ways of inno innovation. Of so, course. Um, that's part of the, of the test, but I think that it could be a good meeting point for technology developers and companies that will re require technologies and using just the test beds to do that, um, that road together mm -hmm. and to transform that, those technologies with, into that product. So uh, I think that it could be a, a real benefit if we can link that, that part, not just uh, showing those infrastructures as, as a uh, service providers, but technology developers and products. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to in that transformation, mm -hmm. I think that uh, we could have a, a real good opportunity to, to catch the interest of the companies, and if they see that interest on, on catching the technologies that we can uh, push there. So, so it's not only the uh, machine park. What you are offering, so you are also offering know-how and, and corporate so, development and oh, all yeah. these things. Okay. Yeah, that's what we are also thinking on the on this. Uh, 
pilot plant for the production of nanopharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And just providing the services of, of doing the, the synthesis of the, or the manufacturing of those small batches, as I, said, I mentioned before, it takes very short time. And we need to maintain that operating a full time to be sustainable. So we are looking for ways of one one platform has been validated going faster to the mm -hmm. to the next step and formulating the ne next uh, drug with the same formulation. So we can uh, move faster in including uh, right. new nano nano medicines into the market. Uh, I want to just add that actually in the case of, for example, supercomputing, the supercomputers are quite general purpose machine, so that actually it's a quite general and in fact that everyone can simply uh, purchase such a system. But uh, it's very difficult for SMEs, you know, just to invest a lot of money just mm -hmm. for a computer without any test whether it uh, mm -hmm. helped them to just to uh, to develop their enterprise and, and so on. That's uh, that's really important to have uh, the options of the, for the access, uh, let's say, for the testing, for uh, let's say, validating the ideas mm -hmm. and, and so on. That's really important, and we need this kind of access. And of course, this is not a business which is scaling up really really easily because imagine. Um, for example, as a one center, we are not able just to uh, to provide such a service mm. to thousands of SMEs. So that's, mm. that's simply impossible. Even you, you, you cannot do that, even uh, just employing more in each uh, country, one uh, center like that or something like that. It's not enough. We need uh, human re resources also on the side of the companies and so on, just to, just mm. to offload uh, the experience there. You know, just to, to help to understand uh, also the companies to be involved uh, in such a business because it's uh, this is not our possibility actually to to serve to all all the SMEs which uh, mm. potentially can use the uh, the supercomputing technology or data uh, data processing technologies and so on. That's that's simply impossible. But anyway, so the access is for the testing. This is really important. So that's mm. that's, uh, that's this is the issue. And if I can follow on from this on, on the subject of bringing the SMEs to us almost, there is always, or at least maybe because I'm involved in nano safety, there is some inertia from, from industry and from SMEs to, to come and work with us. But those who do actually immediately see the benefits of what they discover about the product and that the fact that we're not going to tell them, oh, this is, this is a disaster product, it's super toxic, but we're actually going to help them to design their products in ways that would be um, beneficial to them, and I think opportunities like today are fantastic to to to, to fly the flag of uh, come to us so in mm. our infrastructures. Thank you. One question I, I already um, asked it about it: um, the topic startup um, isn't a technology infrastructure also something that could compensate uh, some missing venture capital in Europe? So because if you are a startup, if you are a technological startup, you have to to, in, to invest very much in technology. You have to have ramp up a machine park and so on. And um, as you all know, Europe is not the best in, in venture capital um, when we look at uh, globally. And could this be an, an option also um, for, for startups? I think, it's, I, I think it's really important, actually. And uh, if we say that the, 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 the companies that are established and they have R&D and everything, yeah. then they have industrialization, I would say, and using test beds for that. But if you talk about startups, we talk more about scale up. Yeah. And then it's about really getting them to, to verify their processes and products very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And we see, we see environments like that in Shenzhen together with Silicon Valley for the business models. And they can really make a, a, a prototype of a product within three weeks. Yeah. I don't, I, we don't really see the, that type of, of uh, environments in Europe yet, and we need to have them because the startups need them. Mm -hmm. So, with a look to the time schedule, um, we have two minutes left. Um, maybe you have a coming home, take home message, um, final remark, um, only two sentences. Well, I, I, well, when I, you think about technology infrastructures, what would you <laughs> like to have, or what is your wish? I think that is interesting. Of, of course, they are interesting. I, I was uh, thinking also on the specialization. I think that uh, at least in the in the field of nanomedicine, what we are covering, it's too broad. I think that we will need to to show value on on really uh, having specialized uh, of uh, test bed or okay. specialized device. Thank you very much. I would just like to say that only with Europe-wide support, these infrastructures can exist. But the benefits are go well beyond Europe. Thank you very much. 
I, you also I think that actually it's uh, really important to, to, to have a support just in building such a, such a uh, infrastructures, but together, of course, with the competence centers and digital innovation hubs. But at the same time, we need to develop the human resources, which yeah. will be able to just to use such, a, such a facilities and results coming from them. Finalize the strategy for European technology infrastructure and secure funding as much as is there is for research infrastructure. That's okay. Thank you very much. So my last word is thank you to the audience for um, being in our session and also thank you for the presenters, the speakers. Uh, thank you very much. attention one minute. Um, if you have nothing to do for the next 30 minutes, I would ask you to go back to the first floor because it is a matter of safety. We can't have too many people here on the second floor. Thank you.